Labor Day weekend, we celebrate the contribution of labor to our society, to our country. Happy Labor Day. It's also picnic weekend, hamburgers and hot dogs and ribs and baked beans and watermelons and all that kind of stuff. That's one of the things about, about holidays. <laughs> There's always something good to eat on a holiday. This is um, from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, which is meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for, for every person that's in the house today and for the ones that are not. We ask your travelers' mercies and your blessings on the ones that are not with us today. And uh, we thank you for the privilege to handle your word and to bring it to the people in this house today, Lord. And we ask you anoint the word and anoint the hearers, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So Solomon's, Solomon's writing this, and he's saying... That we don't, what do we gain from our labor? We're talking about labor today, Labor Day. And in chapter 2, starting with verse 4, he says, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I, I, I. This is all about Solomon. What an ego. I did this and I did that. Verse 8, I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasures of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. Self, self, self. <coughs> it was all about himself. What he's talking about here is all about all the wonderful things he had and did himself. Verse 9, I, become, I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. So the, the anyone before me, the only king in Jerusalem before him was David, his father. And I don't know if, that, if that's what he's talking about. But it does sound to you like this man is worshiping himself and his own accomplishments here. He didn't say, praise God, he enabled me to do this and that. He said, I did, I, 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 I. Worshiping in his own self and his accomplishments. And in chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, he says, What do workers gain from their toil? Remember, we're talking about labor today. In verse 10, I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. And then in chapter 3, verse 13, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. So in other words, he's saying that the labor that you do and allows you to survive eating and drinking and to find some kind of a satisfaction because he had accumulated all this stuff. And he thought it was meaningless, but he said, this is the gift of God, that you're satisfied with what you have done and that you were able to eat and drink. Then in, chapter, then, then in the same chapter, but verse 22, he says, So I saw there is nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work, because that is their lot. For who can bring them to see what will happen after them? How many of you enjoyed your work? Some of you are retired. You re enjoyed your work? You guys enjoy your work? Yeah, you enjoyed your work? Well, according to him, that's a blessing from God that you enjoy your work. Some of us have work or a career 
that brings uh, help or blessing to other people. All of us toil because it's necessary to make a living. We all have to get going, get up in the morning or get up in the night and go do whatever you have to do, deliver the mail, whatever you have to do. And there's a toil that's, that's the human race has to do that. We have to, we have to labor to make a living. And in Genesis chapter 3, 17 and 19, to Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. We're talking about labor today. Verse 18, it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. So now, we all have to toil or labor to survive. Thanks a lot, Adam. <laughs> I used to spend time on my uncle's farm, and he was a dairy farmer, but he worked hard. He got up before the sun, the sun was up, he had, to, he had to round up the cows, get them in the barn, he milked 40 cows, he did it by hand. He had a, he, well he eventually had a pipeline, but he, he took those cans and weighed them and carried them in and poured them into the bulk tank. He worked hard. He really worked hard. He was a sinewy, sort of a gaunt man. But that was hard work. I remember seeing how hard he worked in. Some labor is very demanding physically. You know, thinking about carpenters and mechanics and loggers and miners, assembly line workers. Sometimes nurses have to work a double shift. You ever have to do that, Ruthie? You ever have to work a double shift? Probably. Yep. <laughs> Sometimes that's, they have to do that. Can you imagine? That's hard work. Dedicated teachers, they work hard. They carry their work home. They have to do their corrections and stuff at home. And they carry with them the concerns about kids that are struggling about one thing or another. Isn't, is that true? You carry that in your heart with you when you go home. So the labor continues. It doesn't end when the school bell rings and the kids get on a bus and go home. I made a living as a professional photographer. The first five years were really enjoyable. Then Carol started having babies. <laughs> And that was enjoyable too, but our income was cut in half. And so God made a way for us to move to Illinois. We made a living, twice as much we made, that I could make in Illinois, but the hours were long. Long hours on the road, long hours in the place there. We would go out and photograph all day and make pictures all night. And I really learned how to work in that place, 12 to 16 hours a day. Then God made a way for us to move back to Pennsylvania. I had to buy a studio in order to get back, but all that time we wanted to come back home to PA. And in the studio, it was like the same kind of work I did out in Illinois, but it was, sometimes it seemed like drudgery. But God is good and we made a living. We managed to pay our tithes and with what was, you know, what was left over after taxes and stuff. We made a living. But sometimes our, sometimes we had so many hours in producing the photos in, a, in, the, in our lab there. There were, there were times when my kids slept in the studio in sleeping bags because we had to work all night to make our deadlines. Yeah. Talk about labor. How about the labor of a mom that stays home 24-7, raising kids, looking after kids 24-7. And that's it, a very toilsome labor. There's a labor that isn't physical, but it takes on an emotional toll. 
But anyway, thanks a lot, Adam. <laughs> because we have to toil. So we have to work. We have to labor to provide for our families. Some people don't necessarily make a lot of money, but their work is enjoyable. So they stay in it. Some make good money, but hate the work. I think it's better to make okay money and enjoy the work than to make a lot of money and hate what you do. You just can't wait to retire. So far we're talking about the labor that supports our own life. And that's what Solomon was talking about. But the Bible speaks of another labor. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. This is, uh, the rest of this is in the King James. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That's why I say life is hard, <laughs> but God is good. What we do for him is not in vain. So in that verse, verse 58, that was verse 58 of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, we find the phrase in there, work of the Lord, which is a the theme of that verse. That verse talks about working for the Lord, working for God. Now that word, that word uh, scares some believers, and it bothers some. It bothers them because they don't want to do that work for God. They're busy working for self and doing their own thing. I think uh, by the time we get through with verse 50, we'll see the importance of working for the Lord. <clears throat> our, our labor, talking about labor today. And therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. The word brethren, it doesn't say, uh, he doesn't say some of you. He just said brethren, which includes all believers. It, it seems that some believers think like they're exempt from serving the Lord. But in Luke 10, 2, he says, Therefore he said unto them, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. We're talking about labor today. The Lord said, The laborers, the workers, are few. It was, it was then, and it is now. It's amazing that in the average evangelical church, 10% of the congregation does all the work. The rest just come for worship and the rest of the week is just about their own life if a hundred percent of the congregation it worked in some capacity it would radically change the work we do for God notice it says abounding the abounding that is mentioned therefore my beloved brother be steadfast unmovable always abounding that word refers to being plentiful and to exist in large numbers. Abound means to go beyond. How many saints do you know that are abounding in their work for the Lord? How many believers do you know that are laboring plentifully? Since we're working for God, we are to go 100% in anything that we're doing for God. We are to do our best for God. God is the one that we're working for. Notice the person who inspires us, the second phrase of verse 58, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We don't work for a denomination. We don't work for an organization. We don't work for man. We work for the Lord. If you do what you do for the pastor or for some other person, then you won't be very inspired. The pastor is not very inspiring, but God is. People call it, count it an honor to work for the governor or the president. 
I wouldn't very, be very honored working for this particular one, but, but the greatest honor in the world is to work for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Notice the position <coughs> that is implied in the second phrase of verse 58, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Lord here means master. Master means the one that is in control of your life. Jesus is Lord. That is his position. And when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, we turn over control of our life to him. And we labor for him from then on. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And ye are not your own, for you have been brought, bought with a price. The price was the blood of Jesus and when we receive him as Lord we give up we give our lives to him Paul said in Romans chapter 1 verse 1 a servant of Jesus Christ called himself a servant servants don't do or not do what they want to do they do what their master wants them to do they work for the master now, the reliability of our labor, we're still in verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We find the word steadfast and unmovable, which has reference to being reliable in the work of the Lord. Why would Paul mention being steadfast and unmovable? movable in the work of the Lord. Just as it is in our day, today, some Christians start out being reliable, but then they stop being reliable in the work of God. Satan knows that God wants us to be working for him in this world. Therefore, he uses many stumbling blocks to discourage us to defeat the child of God in working for the Lord. And uh, let's think about some of the tactics that Satan uses. Satan uses people, Galatians 5, 7. Ye did run well, who did hinder you? Satan will work through people to defeat and discourage if you let them. And Satan uses prosperity, 2 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, while some covet after. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with money sorrows. Satan uses pleasure, 2 Timothy 4.10. For Demas hath forsaken me, loved this present world. 2 Timothy 3, 4, traitors, heady, high-minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. This world is like a magnet, and it wants to pull the child of God back into the world. Satan uses people. Satan uses pleasure. Satan uses prosperity. Satan uses problems. Galatians 6, 9. And let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. A lot of Christians grow weary in well-doing uh, when problems come their way. They have a tendency of giving up. Satan knows our weak points and he will do whatever he can to slow us down or defeat us or derail us or get us off the path that God wants us to be on and cause us to quit working for God. Paul encourages us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. The reason for our labor, this is still in verse 58, the last part, the last phrase, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In other words, it is worthwhile. Our laboring is worthwhile now in this present world. Of course, the main reason to work for God is our love for him and his love for us. 
we should love to work for him because of what he did for us we can never repay him for what he has done for us however there are other reasons laboring to evangelize sinners is worthwhile nothing's more thrilling than to see someone get saved and to know that you had a part in it the most worthwhile thing we can do is to lead sinners to Christ don't let me have all the fun <laughs> I do enjoy that so much but laboring to intent to edify saints is worthwhile first Thessalonians 5 11 tell us to edify one another tells us to edify one another edify means to build up we should do everything that we can to see Christians grow after they get saved the most worthwhile thing we can do is work to edify the body of Christ laboring to exalt the Savior is worthwhile working and laboring to exalt exalt our Savior is one of the most worthwhile things we can do while the world is exalting and magnifying the devil the people of God should be busy exalting and magnifying the Lord our laboring is worthwhile now in this present world our laboring will be worthwhile when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 4.13 Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day, for that day, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. If we have served God for the right reason, that is, if our motive has been right, we won't stand there ashamed. We will be glad that we worked for God and were steadfast and unmovable in the work of the Lord. It will be worthwhile when we face our Savior face to face and know that we have worked for him in this present world. For those who have allowed Jesus to be Lord of their life, it will be a day of delight. But for those who did not live and work for God, it will be a day of disgrace. The reward for our labor still in verse 58 the last phrase for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord you know there will be a special crown given to those who were steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord James 1 12 blessed is the man that endureth temptation for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised them that love him this crown is given to those that endure trials instead of those that quit serving and working for God. There will be no crown for those who were not steadfast and those who were movable, but for those that were steadfast and unmovable in the work of God. There will be a crown of life given to them. Of course, you know what we're going to do with the crown. We're going to cast the crown at the feet of Jesus and say you are the only one worthy of receiving the crown because you were unmovable and steadfast in your resolve to go to the cross and take my place and be my substitute so I could be saved and go to heaven. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 1 and 2, as God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. In Psalm 46, 1 and 2, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. 
Though the earth give way, the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. And this is my favorite, Psalm 46.10. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. We labor, but we don't have to do it alone. He's always with us. He's our partner in that. This weekend celebrates the contribution of labor to our society. Picnics, hot dogs, hamburgers, getting together with family and friends. That's where some of us are today. Summer is almost over. Pretty soon the yellow jackets will be gone. <laughs> this has been a bad year for yellow jackets. And the weather's going to start getting a little cooler. Kids are back in school. We need to keep God in the center of everything that we do. Don't be like Solomon. He was centered on his own self. He thought that his labor was meaningless because it was all, all about him. Solomon realized that he couldn't take it with him. And then he thought it was meaningless that he had done all those things. If he had put the same effort into doing things for God, he would have realized that it wasn't meaningless. Everything we do should bring glory to God. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? God, our Father, we thank you so much for this church, Lord. People have been saved since I came here and even and before. People have been saved since I came here, though. It's been my honor to introduce those people to, to you, Lord, as Lord and Savior. And the labor that we do is not a labor in vain. But only with your help can we ab can we be abounding, Lord, like like the, like we want to and like we should. Only with your assistance and your help and your guidance and your Holy Spirit, Lord. But the good news for us is we have that guidance and we have the Holy Spirit and we have your help, Lord. So uh, we we just thank you so much for that. And as we continue to do what we can to be a blessing and to bring people to you as Lord and Savior. We just pray, Lord, that you will enable us to do that and to help us do that. And um, bless your church and bless your people, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.